Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for muting yourselves until it's time to speak. Um, just simple introductions. This is Love Coach Academy, and we have with us the the uh, benevolent dictator Scott Katamas, who oversees all of us um, and makes sure that we function somewhat. Um, and it's really great to see all your faces and uh, so many people I feel like I haven't seen in a little while. So thanks for joining us today. My name is Timothy Earl. I'm on the island of Maui in Hawaii. I am, besides being a love coach, um, a life coach and a family dynamics coach. And I've been coaching for over 20 years. Um, what I really love working on is sexuality, relationships, um, intimacy, and yet I do a variety of other things. I'm really well versed in what I would call child regression work, um, among other things. And I would like Heidi to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Heidi Love. I'm excited to be here for Love Coach Academy and love teaching with Timothy. We always have a great time teaching together. Um, I have been doing this work for 20 years and it evolves over the years of what kind of specialty that I'm working in, but I love working with families, couples, and individuals. And I'm well versed in working with people going through the grieving process. I did hospice work for nine years as a part of that, helping families um, stay intimate during the dying process and love to work with um, family dysfunction and uh, <laughs> people that are in recovery from addiction and want to deepen their relationships. I'm a person in recovery myself and I uh, just love all those, those topics, codependency and all the yummy stuff that we grow up with in childhood. It may not serve us in adulthood. <laughs> so, I'm excited and to talk about jealousy because through my life, sometimes I haven't been jealous and sometimes I've been extremely jealous. And uh, I think we teach what we best need to learn and it's up for me right now. So I'm so excited Timothy wanted this topic. <laughs> Because it's just, you know, that always happens with me. Whatever I need to work on, it comes up to teach or share or whatever. And it, I can be real with it with everyone else. So thanks. And I just put my info in the chat box. If you could do the same, Heidi, just your name and email or website. Um, if you want to speak with Heidi or I about some possible coaching, you can do that by emailing me or texting me or Heidi. We both do a free half hour, 20 minute intake call to make sure that we are a good fit. And we also do a call, uh, I co-host with Heidi, her recovery talk, which happens every Tuesday at um, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we cover a variety of topics around codependency, love addiction, love fantasy, boundaries, uh, recovery, process addiction, substance addiction, all kinds of things. So, and all of those uh, talks are on the Love Coach Academy website or on our pages as well. Okay. Um, I see Scott has his little dog. And does your dog have any announcements? Mm -hmm. I was muted. No, no, this is Jasmine Bear one of the two dogs. So uh, all species are welcome with Love Coach Academy. And thank you, Timothy and Heidi for kicking off. This is our first class in the new masterclass series. Um, and so it's good that Love Coach Academy is coming back into doing classes and this shoot's going to be all of our different people. And a lot of the people that are here today are going to be teaching classes later on this year over the next few months. Uh, so, um, but to probably about half the people looking out are going to be teaching classes. So we're really excited about that. And take it away, Heidi and Timothy. So our topic today is understanding jealousy. But before we get into that, um, I'd like all of you, if you're willing, and there's no 
you know, forcing you to either have your feet flat on the floor or you're sitting in lotus position like Candace. And then your hands on your knees, either palms up, palms down, straighten your spine and then relax it a little bit. And then if you would, just close your eyes or leave them slightly parted. Relax your jaw. And we're just gonna drop in to a moment of presence with each other since we're all over the globe. And with this beautiful technology that we have at our disposal, we're actually able to be in the same moment visually and with sound. I'd like us to recognize that we're all sitting on the same planet, breathing the same atmosphere. And so in many ways, we are absolutely connected and in the same space and time with each other. And just notice your breath moving through your nostrils. If you can, focus on the sensation of the air as it moves past the opening in the nostrils. And there's no doing anything. There's just being aware of thoughts or emotions or physical sensations, the gravity pulling your body down to your chair, or onto your bed, your hands on your knees, your clothing, any sounds you can hear, the rain dripping outside, or the occasional rooster in my case. And if you will, I'd like you to imagine you're from the top of your head all the way down your spine, a line, and to recognize that you have two hemispheres, a right and a left, right brain, left brain, right cheek, left cheek, right eye, left eye, right ear, left ear, all the way down, right shoulder, left shoulder. Be aware of these things as I say, then your right hand, your left hand, right hip, left hip, right knee, left knee, right foot, left foot. And if you will, as you breathe in and out, come to the mid space between your right and left hemispheres. See if you can't be aware of that part of your body that goes right down the middle. Sometimes it helps to just lean back a little bit, feel the spine. And when you're ready, just lift your hands up above your head, give yourself a little stretch. Wiggle around, and open your eyes. Thank you for coming into presence with each other. So we're going to start with this question, what is jealousy? Most of us are taught that it is bad. Stay away from jealousy. Do everything you can to make sure you don't get jealous. And a lot of us have a misconception that jealousy is an emotion. And if that's something that you believe, I'm asking you to just let that go for a moment. Jealousy isn't um, an emotion in my book. It's a complex arrangement of beliefs and emotions. Um, but I'd like for today's class for us to open up to the possibility that jealousy can be a pathway for greater integration and greater understanding of ourselves. What do I mean by greater integration? It's this kind of buzzword these days. Integration meaning really coming to terms with or examining all the different parts of myself, the parts of me that I developed in my primary years. Some of those things may be unconscious, things that we internalized as a child. 
the belief systems that were laid upon me or modeled to me by my parents, by my church or lack of church, by the society in which I live, by media, all of these things are a part of this complex word called jealousy. So jealousy can become a pathway for understanding our beliefs, our core wounding, our family of origin story, can really be our friend which sounds interesting, right? It's like a bittersweet thing. Oh, wow, I'm getting jealous. And rather than run from it or try to stop it or control it, let me look deeper into this thing that's happening to me called jealousy. We can think of jealousy as a state of being or an experience that we're having. And... Um, can I ask can I everyone a question? But yeah, yeah, just want a show of hands. Like who, when they have felt jealous, immediately goes to, I shouldn't be jealous, or you make yourself somehow wrong about it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. But that is something that I, you know, it's the group consciousness of I shouldn't be that because somehow it's bad. And we want to help dispel that today. You know, there was a point in my life where I did say jealousy is the worst experience I could possibly imagine having. Out of all the things that are available to experience, that's the worst. Please, please you know, do everything I can to make sure I don't feel that way. And yet many of us do when we're little kids, right? My sister got a big box of crayons. <gasps> Mm, I want those crayons. No, you can't have those crayons. Oh, God. And then set about doing all kinds of strange coping mechanisms. Tried to manipulate the crayons from her, steal the crayons from her. At one point, I think I did trick her and gave her some ice cream. And so I took all the crayons and I was jealous. Yeah, that's a good point, Timothy, because is it really the jealousy that's bad that we feel? Or do we feel bad about how we act around it? And I know for me, it's the latter. You know, how did I respond to my jealousy? And I, I have acted poorly and I've seen other people act poorly and I've seen people act in a wonderful way, which Timothy's gonna share today. Like how do we use it for our greater good? She, uh, my sister growing up too, my, our entire life was dad loves you more than he loves me. She was very jealous of our relationship. I, you know, I was like, I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't really understand what was going on in her. I'm giving these examples because I'm trying to take jealousy out of if Heidi and I are in relationship with each other and Heidi wants to go and have a date with her ex-husband and I go, oh, oh my God, what's happening? And I get jealous. That's the kind that most of us think about. But jealousy can show up in all kinds of ways. Oh, look at that guy. He's driving a Tesla. Yeah, I don't like him. Or, oh, I wish I was him. Or there's something wrong with me. You can see we're starting to get into the complexity of it. Um, what happens a lot of the times is that jealousy affects our mind, our nervous system. It affects our emotional state, our heart, and it affects literally our body. Most of us have a physical reaction when we're in jealousy. Um, some of us, it can make us sick, give us headaches, uh, all kinds of extreme physical sensations. It also is, it. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just thinking I would read uh, the comment. It says, um, is there a difference between jealousy and envy? And I realized from listening to Timothy that jealousy is so much more than relationship with significant other. Yeah, I think um, envy is kind of a milder version, right? Envy is more that Tesla example I was giving, but we can get so envious that we're actually jealous. So I, I would put envy and jealousy on a spectrum. Um, the other great thing that jealousy can help us look at is our attachment style. How secure are we? How much do we really know that we're loved and everything's okay no matter what's going on around us? And it can also really show us how anxious we are or avoidant we are. And it might 
um, be different with different situations and different people. Some people were more secure and other people were um, more anxious or more avoidant. Or... And so I also want us to think about, there are times that with, and Heidi and I is gonna help me with this in a little bit, or maybe now, maybe now is a good time to give that example of how we might be attached to one person one way and it's fine when they go see their ex, but we're attached to a different person. And when they want to go see their ex, God, it triggers us differently. Yeah, I'll, I'll share that story. And I think this comment is perfect too, that I'll read. For me, jealousy is a fear response, fear of loss, touching deeply to my abandonment wound around my absent father. It is a place where I feel like I can't source my needs and like the safe person doesn't want to give it to me. And that is perfect segue for my story. Thank you for sharing that, Trish. Um, I also love to look up definitions. So I wanted to read the definition of envy and jealousy before I share my story. Um, I think like Timothy does, that they're a spectrum, you know, where are we at on the spectrum? But it says envy means disconnected longing for someone else's advantages. And jealousy means unpleasant suspicion or apprehension of rivalship. So I thought that was interesting. You guys can <laughs> take what you want from that. Um, I was sharing with Timothy as we were preparing to teach this class the spectrum of jealousy that I've had in my life. Cause there's been years in my life, I would say, oh, I'm really not a jealous person. And there's been years in my life where I've been uh, fearfully jealous. And I love that Trish put fear because for me that is definitely connected to jealousy. And so I wanna encourage you guys today as we go through this class to become aware of where it comes from for you, what triggers it for you? Because every human is different, of course, and we have different core wounding and different triggers. So my jealousy seems to stem from fear and also abandonment. And it depends on the container that I'm in because safety soothes, soothes that fear. So in my relationships where I've felt secure attachment and there's a lot of trust and safety and communication, I didn't feel jealous because I felt safe and honored with that person. And then in my relationships where the communication might be a strain or there is been broken trust or a container that is not created safety for my particular self, I feel a lot of fear. And then when I feel a threat, I get jealous of outside things. And it's not just other people, like that can trigger it. If I feel unsafe or threatened by another person interfering in the relationship, that can trigger jealousy. But also if I don't feel my needs are met and there's no communication around it or it's strained, um, I don't feel safe that I'll be cared for. So I might be jealous of anything outside that feels like it's taking time away or attention away or safety away. So it's not just like other people, it can be very broad. So I want you guys to think about, you know, what triggers it for you. And right now I'm talking about an intimate relationships, not the other spectrum of jealousy, which is definitely out there. Um, but the tenderness I feel in relationship and the jealousy that is triggered from fear when I don't have what I consider safety. And I say that because the other person might think you're perfectly safe, but I don't feel safe, right? So that. If you would like, you can go ahead and put in the chat box um, what you feel as Trish did your kind of core trigger to jealousy is uh, Heidi shared you know, a fear of abandonment. Um, that's also the same for me. And we're going to get into in a little bit, like, um, where did that fear of abandonment come from? There was a, a um, thing that happens when we are triggered into jealousy is most of us move into an amygdala response or a fast brain response. In the form of jealousy, this could be called a primal panic. And we, 
we either go into run away or fighting with our partner or the person that's involved or we freeze don't know what to do or some of us flop over kind of like we just lay down um and so that too jealousy can be a really good way of helping us look at what is our automatic response and to notice it and we'll get into some of the tools later that we can use to move out of that um, fast brain response that primal panic response and more into a conscious uh, way of relating with our partners when we are triggered into jealousy um, i want to just share my screen here do you want me to read a few of the comments while you're sure go right up? ahead yeah I don't want to interrupt your flow. So if I ever jump in and I am, just tell me to. <laughs> well, uh, let's, lost... let's, see. let's say this and then we'll read the comments. So yeah. just, I just wanted to put out a little screen. We've got jealousy. I'm showing it as an umbrella. Back to this idea that jealousy is a state. It's a, a being. It's something that we experience. It's not an emotion and it's not a belief. It's a complex combination of beliefs. I'm insecure. I tell myself there's something to be afraid of. I, I'm being betrayed. I'm inadequate. I'm not enough. I'm going to be all alone. I'm, I'm being taken for granted. I am being victimized. I'm being threatened, violated. We could keep going. There's a lot of beliefs here. But there's emotions as well, which is I feel frightened. I feel sad. I feel disappointed. I, I'm scared. I feel hurt. I feel angry, um, frustrated, we could come up with a lot of, of different emotions. And there's something that Love Coach Academy teaches, which is that sometimes we, we get caught up in the story and we think I'm being abandoned or I'm jealous. And in reality, there are other primary emotions that are happening underneath that. And so I just wanted to illustrate that, yes, jealousy triggers a variety of beliefs and stories and then if we can examine them, we can hopefully move into what are the feelings that are coming up? And then we can move into this thing that I think Heidi is about to share in the comments, which is where does that come from? What is actually getting triggered in my family of origin or core wounding? Go ahead, Heidi. Yeah, I, I'm just, oh, I wanna read a couple of these comments and so I don't lose my train of thought. This inspires so much inside me. Um, and reading these comments too, I'm just feeling really tender and connected to all of you. It's such a tender part of all of us that is triggered into jealousy. Um, so it's, ooh, there's a lot of them. Uh, so if I miss yours, please forgive me. Um, for me, let's see, my jealousy is caused by some very scary stories I tell myself based on past pains and abandonments, not being chosen, being left out. I notice scarcity is connected to my jealousy, feel, fear of loss, um, core trick. I wrote mine, fear, imagining I'm threatened, overall fear of loss or the belief I'm not enough. So kind of in, in we, you guys can all read through those two and we'll read more as we go. Um, not enough love, not enough money. So there's a, a lot of fear, not enough, um, I think as we go through this, it'd be cool to break it down. Like, where was it triggered and how do we find that out? Like, what is underneath it for you? And then Timothy has that beautiful umbrella to kind of break it down and discover it. And you may have a different methodology. My brain works in methodology. And um, looking at how do we have self-care around it? How can we use it as our friend to bring us closer to ourselves and others rather than create distance? And for me, I have some definite things that work. And I know Timothy works a lot with this and you know has a lot to share around that. So what is it you wanted me to share right now about that story? <laughs> oh, you're muted, Timothy. The example I was hoping you would share was about, and then we're gonna go to uh, breakout rooms and in the breakout rooms, we're going to have some time to just really explore and discuss with each other. Each person will have like three minutes. 
to talk about how jealousy has shown up in their relationships and maybe the effects of jealousy in their relationships. And then we'll come back, we'll do a little bit more and about tools and things and what compersion is. And then we'll move into another breakout and then we'll come back and finish up the class today. But right now it'd be nice if you could share how you you had a relationship before the one that you're in now where you didn't really get jealous. And then you have this one where it comes up a lot. Uh, I know it's even somewhat active currently. So um, I thought you might share what your thoughts are about why though, why that's different, because that'll also lead into um, where does jealousy come from and what's getting triggered and how. Mm -hmm. So I have a core wound of I'm not important or I'm not enough. And for me, <clears throat> that's triggered when I don't feel important, don't feel safe when I have those stories running, right? So if you think of, if you have a core trigger, things that happen outside of you can trigger the story. This means I'm not enough. This means I'm not important. And so th there's a couple things. One is in my past relationship, um, there were actions taken that soothed that part of me. I felt like I was the most important thing in the world. I felt that he was so proud of me, he shared me with the world, like always seeing how proud of me he was, like wore me like a pretty penny. And I like that. I know some women are like, I'm not going to be like that. I love that feeling of being something, you know, to somebody. So that was one piece. Um, the other piece is I think that there is, insane attraction levels <laughs> I use insane because our mind can go away right when you have when you have a attraction level that is manageable it seems easier in relationship I, I, do you guys know what I'm saying like sometimes you're very attracted to someone and it feels safe and it's good and then you're so attracted to somebody that it creates fear just right off the bat because you're just madly attracted to them and the thinking isn't always straight can you guys relate <laughs> okay so that is part of it that plays in with me but more than the attraction piece I think it's the container of safety that I can create in a relationship so if this if I feel important by certain things that are happening if I feel safe to talk about anything and I'm not made wrong about it. For instance, if we're out in a group experience and I feel jealous and I can go to the person and name that and they're, they're there for me, they're present, they, they reassure that, hey, I'm here for you, I'm not abandoning you, um, that feels safe and the jealousy can go down. However, that is all putting power outside myself. I'm, I'm waiting for them to soothe me, which is wonderful. And I think that it's wonderful to be with a partner that you feel that safe with. However, the lesson has been in this current relationship because that kind of soothing is not available for me right now. I have learned to go inward and self-soothe that younger part of me that is, um, that is telling myself the story that I'm not safe and not important or that I'm threatened because someone else might be better or cuter or younger or sweeter or whatever it is. And remember that I mean, part of mine is self-talk. That's one of the solutions. And I know Timothy's gonna go into solution, but something that really helps me is coming back to myself and remembering that I am worthy, that I am important that I'm lovable. And if I'm with someone who doesn't see that or meet me in that way, why would I want to be with them? And actually I, that is self-talk that helps me. So I, I take the power back instead of making that outside entity, my higher power, I take my power back and I'm like, I'm just me. I'm me every day. And whether someone loves me or not is really none of my business. I'm just me. I can't change anyway. I mean, we all change and evolve, but you guys hopefully get what I'm saying. I'd be I... the best version of me in every given moment. And if I'm loved, <laughs> wonderful. And if I'm not, then someone else can love me. In if, I, <laughs> if I say something similar, but it may, it may be a little different than Heidi. Um, we all have 
if we if we look at relationship from a Freudian perspective, most of us when we're growing up, we look at our mother or father or both as Oh my God, that's who I want to marry. Many of us, when we're children, are like, mommy, I want to marry you, right? When we're little. And we don't really understand what we're saying. But what we are saying is that we are projecting this idea of love and modeling it after one of our parents or both. Um, our core wounding also gets involved. And so we internalize beliefs often when we're children. Most of us have some soft trauma, hard trauma. For me, it was, I, I'm not good enough. My dad left. I'm, I'm afraid of being abandoned. I'm terrified of being um, not good enough. I have found myself often being supercharged and attracted to the perfect person to bring that up to the point where you know, if they weren't texting me back, I might start getting jealous. Usually I was in relationship with the opposite, where if I wasn't texting back, my partner was like, where are you? What are you doing? Starting just to freak out. I wasn't even doing anything, quote unquote, wrong. Just my partner's getting really, really upset. The chemistry and the sexual attraction with these partners was off the charts, but it was out of my possibility to stay centered and for them to stay centered. And so I often advise people when I'm coaching them and they're looking to date or they are getting into relationship, where is this at the range of your ability to manage um, your own anxiety, your own triggers? And it's great to have attraction. It's great to have chemistry. You need a certain amount in order to have a an intimate relationship with someone. And at the same time, if it goes so strong that your frontal lobes lift every time you're around them and you can't actually use your executive functioning and think, it may be a situation where it's, it's too much for you. It can feel great for that first three months to two years. And then often we start to have all of these core wounds and other things come up. And again, I think with proper support, um, and a lot of good coaching, especially if it's in an area that that fits you, you can probably work through a lot of these things. And I'm glad you're here today. And we're going to dive in now. I'm going to send us to breakout rooms. You'll get a little uh, notice on your screen, and you just click on it. It'll take you to that breakout room. And can I on a pro go ahead, Heidi? Just before we jump into breakout rooms, I think it's really important. Um, what, everything you guys wrote is so awesome. I want to name a couple things. I call it sex brain from Lorna. And staying centered and grounded is important. And this can become difficult in cases of extreme interest and attraction. It's like a balancing act from George. I love those. And I really think it's important what Paul said. My biggest challenge is my reaction to their reaction. Can I be compassionate with myself if they leave me? want somebody else and I think that's essentially the question like can we love ourselves even if someone leaves us are we going to make it our fault and I don't know about you guys but <clears throat> this is why I wanted to share this I have been doing this 20 years and just this year this epiphany came <laughs> because um, how many of you when someone acts poorly you might act react in a way that you don't love but if someone's behaving great, you can behave great. Yeah, I'm pretty good at that. You know, if someone's pretty easy to get along with and they can meet me, I'm, I'm golden. But if, if they show me their stuff, you know, then I can rationalize coming right back at them. So I think this reaction thing is really important and something I've really adopted this year. And I just was inspired to share it because of Paul's thing is that each person in relationship is 100% responsible. It's not 50-50. Like, I, I remind myself of that now. Like, when I want to react because I think someone is reacting very poorly, <laughs> I pause and go, well, you're still 100% responsible for Heidi for how you act in this relationship, no matter how the other person is acting. And that has rocked my world and is very hard for me to practice. So I wanted to share. So we're going to go to breakout rooms. Thank you, Heidi. And um, I have Heidi, you're running one of the rooms. Um, 
Paul, if you would be willing to just facilitate making sure everybody gets the same amount of time in the other room. And then um, Anaprava, if you would facilitate room three. And um, we're going to give everybody three minutes. Uh, there's two groups of six. I'm going to try to come into the room three and balance that out and make that six. And so we'll take 20 minutes for this breakout um, session. And the idea is to give everyone a little bit of time to talk about um, when they've been jealous and what, if they really examine it, what it's bringing up and where, where is that, what's the origin of that jealousy? Where did that come from? Any questions from Anaprava mostly or Paul or Heidi? Okay. Should be seeing on your screen uh, something that'll take you to your room. You just click on that. I see people disappearing. So here they go. Boom, boom, boom. And did I not get you guys into rooms? Oh, Jay, let's see. I thought I had you. And Jan. Hmm. Oh. Sorry, I click I click something and I'm um, yeah I'm trying to move you one second yeah I click oh, yeah, something you're frozen or something yeah I accidentally clicked something and I didn't see what it said yeah it should have taken you to your room but you're frozen let me see well uh, I'm gonna move you to room three. Try okay. that. Okay, Scott, you're gonna stay here. Okay, I'm gonna move you to, huh, that's funny. How's that? Can you click on that? No.
Welcome back. Looks like we have most of us back. Um, if I could just have the group leaders, there's Paul, Anaprava, and Heidi, summarize briefly the overall aspect of each of your groups. And Anaprava did a great job reminding people that those group sessions were not recorded. They're very private, and we will all keep the information confidential. So thank you for being vulnerable. Heidi, you want to go first? Mm -hmm, you've muted. Sorry, I was um, connected. We were talking right as we went out. So I wanted to address that, Trev. I'm sorry that we lost you. I was loving what you were saying. Um, I'm so touched by this and by hearing what I'm really present to, and I think in our group, is the tenderness around where it comes from. And then having that realization and also some of those people in our group were able to share their reaction to jealousy and how they might want to change that one person shared anger. Um, they react angrily and um, I'm, I'm still processing all the sweetness that was shared. There were really deep experiences and and just have a lot of compassion for those parts of ourselves. And one thing that came clear to me just in talking out loud in the group was that um, not only our childhood wounds trigger the jealousy around it, but what judgments do we have around comparing ourselves to others and thinking we should be something else and how that ties into jealousy too came up in our group. Great. Thank you. And let's see, there's Paul. Paul. Thank you. Um, wow, I'm still in it at some levels because uh, not only was I the leader, but I was also a participant because this is up in my life and has been for a long time, you know, jealousy and fear. And so much of what was talked about is a lot of like, in childhood that it happened from a young age of not feeling safe and not feeling comfortable and feeling like people were going to lose out and their parents did not create a safe environment for um, them and and then it's like moving up into life do we trust the universe is happening to us or for us <laughs> like the it, this is happening to me and all, the last thing i'll say is we also talked a tiny bit about when you're the you know most of the conversation has been about us feeling jealous but also the last part is when we're triggering jealousy what do we do with that and can we be compassionate when we're the object that is triggering pain in our partner and how do we be compassionate with ourselves and with them Beautiful. Thank you, Paul. Anna Prabhu, where did you go? There you are. Okay. Here I am, right next to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Wow, feels so good to be back home <laughs> again. Huh. Just this, just this deep sharing is just so healing, you know, and, and tuning in everybody's really courageous vulnerability. And, and just thank you for a few people are, are new, are just coming into this and they're so courageous and so vulnerable. So, um, you know, what came up were like core wounds, you know, the core wound, the abandonment, um, the um, not feeling good enough, the not enough, right? The not being seen, the not being heard, not being considered. And the feelings then on this, the panic, the fear, the worthlessness, you know, is this person, you know, am I going to be left alone forever? I'll never love again. Just this, this, this really paralysis that can set in, right? And, and so, um, you know, there's also interesting in our group, we had a kind of interesting group between the poly group and the monogamous, right? And, and the different ways, you know, that's handled and worked with and and then there was even this recognition of maybe the person didn't have a poly person maybe didn't have the 
feeling of jealousy in the partnership, but maybe that came up in friendship of, one, of feeling excluded, of not feeling like um, they were chosen to be a friend, for example, or maybe not as important as somebody else. And, and how does that, how do you, how do you, how does that feel? You know, where, where is that coming from? Or also this aspect of from our childhood wounding, this core wounding that we come up with. And then if we're not healing it, if we, with, this, is, this was a good point of the communication. When communication breaks down, that's when jealousy kicks in, as what somebody said. So not being able to communicate. We're not being able to communicate. You're not being seen. You're not being heard. You're not being accepted into the tribe. If you're not in the tribe, it means death, right? That's survival. It gets down to survival, you know? And we all, then the reptilian, how am I get the strategies of how am I going to survive? Right? So this is really powerful, deep stuff. And the more communication and openness that, you know, that we get to experience in this is, is so healing, you know, and puts a light on it. And also maybe heals the, you know, when you're growing up in this sort of toxic environments, you have a tendency to feel comfortable in the same toxic environments as you get older and you recreate them and recreate them. And so being witness to that and maybe, wow, am I creating the same toxic environment again and going, how can I recreate it? So those are a few of our points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just trying to make sure I, are we all back in gallery view? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of moving directly into, well, what do we do with jealousy? How do we turn it from jealousy to compersion? Or how do we at least get to where we can be centered and stay resourced in the face of jealousy? Compersion might be a lofty goal for some. I do want to point out that there are some people, and there were in our group, who don't really know what jealousy is to the same degree as others. They haven't experienced it, sometimes because they haven't experienced that really strong Freudian love, um, or because they are just, they were maybe grow, grew up in a family that was very secure, and they were very resourced, and they don't really go to uh, I'm going to be left or abandoned when their partner is um, doing, you know, something else. And a good example came up where one person's partner likes to surf and the, uh, they're home late sometimes. And in that, in that moment, there's a recognition of I'm not being valued. I don't feel valued. I don't feel respected here. Right. And that's probably not what the other partner that's surfing wants to trigger. They're not intending that. They're just having a great time. Another good way, another good way. Oh my God. And, and so we want to work towards a few things, communication, boundaries, and at the same time, an acceptance and a, a soothing or a loving of ourself and our own core wound and what's being triggered and what's being brought up. So it's an external internal dance. And if we use the example of the surfing, hey, sweetie, I, I really get frustrated and angry and feel unvalued and I feel disrespected. It's my feelings. When you come home an hour after you said you were going to be there and what can we do about this, right? We're moving into communication and maybe we get to a boundary of, why don't you go ahead and eat dinner without me and take care of yourself and do what you need to because I just can't promise that I'm going to come home. Uh, surfing's too great. And the other person, well, my boundary would be that we come up with a time where you do come home and maybe we go an extra hour and we have dinner a little bit later and and so we come to some agreement, each person setting their boundaries, each person is responsible for them. And at the same time, as Paul was pointing out, if I'm the person at home who feels unvalued and rejected, I'm going to probably be getting anxious or upset. Well, most people, when their partner's anxious or upset, don't really want to deal with it. They tend to avoid or move into like, ah, I don't want to, you know, later. I don't want to talk about this. 
And that usually makes the other person more angry, more upset, more anxious. So we want to, in relationship, lean in, call each other in, rather than calling each other out or pushing each other away, communicate, come up with boundaries that work for us, and at the same time, own, this reminds me of when I was a little girl or a little boy, and my father was always absent. He wasn't emotionally available. He always came home late from work. He didn't show up to the dinner table. And you coming home late from surfing and me, it just completely triggers my childhood family of origin stuff, right? And we're owning that and sharing that because then our partner most likely is going to go, oh, now I understand what's happening and what I'm triggering. And I really don't want to be the cause of that most of the time. I want to actually come to this agreement and show up on time and be there for you. Whereas when we start out with, they come home and we're just, and they're like, hey, hi, yeah. oh, thanks for making food. Oh, it's a little cold. Yeah, you're damn right, it's cold, you know? And we're not really calling together, we're calling out, we're pushing away, right? And if we can be more vulnerable and talk about our experience and come into communication, back into boundaries and sharing vulnerably what's going on with us, often we can stay together, bring it in. In cases of polyamory, really important, I think, to get some support and a coach, um, probably in any area of jealousy, even if we're in monogamy relationships. But if in polyamory, from my own experience, I really wish that I had hired someone and listened to them in the beginning, because there's a lot that can be avoided through learning about how to communicate. And an example is really being able to express what our need is. You know, when you go off tonight with your other lover or you go in a monogamy situation, you're gonna go see your ex-wife. Here's what I would really like. I would like you to text me a couple of times during the date or during dinner. And I would like you to tell me right now, I'm gonna cry, I don't know why. I'd like you to tell me right now that you're coming home. I just need reassurance. Right. And I think it's really okay to express those needs vulnerably and have our partner say, yes, of course, I'm coming home. You're the most important thing in my life. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to have dinner with my ex. Or I'm going to go see my lover and then I will be back and I will be back at this time. And then to be there. Or another silly example is I'm going off on this new date and I promise you all we're going to do is talk, go for a walk, hold hands. And then even though you're really tempted to kiss and do some other things, you don't. And you come back and you've shown it up in the way that the partner needed you to. And you're moving slowly, you know, with this. The surfing example is great. The ex-wife example is great. I'm also trying to cover polyamory. So please know that I'm not advocating for polyamory. And I'm not advocating against or for monogamy. And I'm not talking about surfing's bad. I'm just trying to give us a whole breadth of things. So, Heidi. I'm reading all these comments in the box. I love having everyone so active in the conversation. Um, I find it so hard to find kind words when I'm feeling jealous. I have to feel calmer and connected before we can talk. It sometimes takes a while. I find things like belly to belly works wonders to help my body feel safe enough to share with my current partner anyway. I think that's so important. And in my group, we talked a lot about it's okay to be jealous. How do we show up for ourselves and, and how do we react in the relationship when we're jealous? So that's a great tip, you guys, knowing I mean, Sarah shared, she takes a pause before she reacts with the words and maybe some skin to skin contact. And so looking at what do we need? I'm really touched by what Timothy shared that it's not, I mean, there's the black and white thinking, right? Well, if I could do comparison all the time, I wouldn't have an issue and we would not talk about jealousy. And that would be great, right? But it doesn't always happen that way. So how can you create a level of safety with yourself? What things can you do to self-soothe when it comes up? So we can't always look for the perfect reaction from another person. And if we can 
you know, have some compersion if there was some boundaries and we know we could and let them feel free to enjoy whatever it is they want to enjoy, whether it's, you know, watching a television show and you really need some attention. I mean, we're not only talking relationship here. What do you need? So getting present, what would you need in order to feel really good about their happiness in that situation? And then being able to request that, like, you know, I would love to feel totally free and happy and have you have that. And what would really help me do that is this. And then, you know, I want to add the caveat of what do we do to self-soothe when they can't meet it? I've been in a very situation where that's not met. And so I've had to go to the next step of how do I take care of me when someone else can't? And then looking at, it's wonderful to be in a relationship with people who can care for each other in that way. It makes it a whole lot easier. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, I'm you, Heidi is alluding and talking about compersion and it's okay on the other extent too and someone in our you know breakout session pointed this out to recognize sometimes we're a mismatch one person needs to a lot more freedom and the other person needs a lot more uh, containment security and it can be a mismatch Sometimes with coaching, we can find this nice balance that Heidi's talking about where we're able to take care of ourselves, communicate. But sometimes it's just better to say, I can't meet you here in your freedom. I need more security. Or I can't meet you in that level of security and devotion and commitment. I need more freedom. And we want to find people who can allow us to operate with our core value. Compersion is beautiful, but it only works if we're again, a good, a good match. If I love dogs and Scott wants, he's my best friend and he wants to go play with somebody's new puppy dog and not play with our dogs. I'm like, oh, I, well, our dogs need attention. I, I don't want you going and playing with that puppy dog, right? I may be not a good match for Scott because maybe Scott loves playing with everybody's puppy dogs, right? And so Scott goes out and plays with puppy dogs and comes home all happy. And I'm pissed off that he didn't take our dogs with him and that he's playing with other people's puppy dogs. Oh God, disgusting. It just pisses me off, hurts me, makes me feel afraid. Whereas a really good match might be where Scott comes home and he's like, I found a puppy here and so much fun. He licked my mouth and oh my God, he smells so great. And I'm like, oh wow, I'm so happy for you. I wish I'd been there with you. That's so awesome. I hope you get to play with more puppy dogs. Notice we take puppy dogs out and we put in a lover and our belief systems change and our culture and our religion and all the things that have been laid on it. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those, with our programming, but we want to meet and relate intimately with people who can be in the same bubble that we're in. If I'm in a green bubble and you're in a red, you know, we probably just shouldn't be trying to make each other red and green. So, however, we might go, okay, I accept you being red. I accept you being green. We really do. And we do the work so that we can overlap and make whatever color that is, help me out, uh, green and red, make something brown. Um, so you're, you're, purple blue and red would make purple so we use blue and red <laughs> we've got this nice purple overlay and if you get into it um you know jealousy can also help us really begin to look at codependency begin to look at love addiction love fantasy it's it's really a great pathway to examine ourselves and examine our relationship and it i don't think we're gonna have time today but to move into compersion and how to actually develop muscles of compersion. The puppy dog analogy is a good beginning, but there are things we can do. And again, I think just going really slow and communicating where we're, our upset is. And so, you know, it, it might be in the surfing example that I sit my partner down and say, I just need to let you know, I'm jealous of surfing and I'm actually resentful of surfing and I hate surfing. And, I hate the fact that it takes you away from me and I, I really want to spend more time with you and I'm not interested in surfing, right? This is that red and, and uh, blue coming to make purple. We try to find a place where there's room for surfing 
and there's room for the relationship. So, um, ideally, we'd get to the place then when we have the boundaries and everything else that we're like, God, I'm so grateful you're going surfing. Have a great time because we know they're coming home now at seven to have dinner with us and we can really love and enjoy their surfing practice. And that's where we want to, I think, get to in our relationships. So, um, Heidi, I had thought we would do another breakout session, but we are at time. Are there any other thoughts or things you want to add? And then we'll open it up to question and answers. And if someone needs to leave, fully understand. Um, but I do want to allow for time for people to just ask questions. Yeah, I think jumping in with the group is where I want to go. Mm -hmm. Great. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and uh, we'll... Scott, go ahead. I have to admit, it's not a question, but I'd love to just share a couple of quick riffs. And thank you. It's a great class. You guys are doing awesome. Um, I wanted to say that I've coached a lot of, obviously, a lot of couples and families on polyamory and such. And uh, it's really important to honor moving at the pace of the slower person. Um, and that's true within ourselves as well. Like if we're striving to achieve compersion, recognizing what part of me is ready for that and what part of me needs to move more slowly. Um, and so, you know, there's a, the most famous Shakespeare quote of all is to thine own self be true. But that doesn't mean being selfish or stubborn, you know, because if we're going to engage in any relationship, monogamous or polyamorous, we need to, we're committing to growth. We're committing to evolution if we're gonna be in a relationship with anybody, right? It requires growth, evolution, and movement. But it's really important to honor what is my authentic, genuine, healthy pace. And the last thing I'll say about that is I, I like the analogy of if you're exercising or doing yoga, you wanna stretch and breathe, there needs to be some discomfort but you don't hurt yourself. You don't go so far that you rip a tendon or something like that. It's the same thing in any form of relationship growth. What's my, where am I stretching? Where am I growing? Where am I moving? But doing it at a pace that's healthy and not hurtful. So I just wanted to add that piece. It's really a good piece. And one of the keys is to thy own self be true, but also if I'm in love with my partner, to listen and move at their pace. And then we get to where maybe it's a mismatch. If we just can't move at that pace or they're not moving at all, or they don't want to move, then we have to evaluate that and learn to, to separate. But I, the other thing besides not you know stretching, breathing, not hurting yourself is really not expecting your partner to be something they're not. And we can be an apple and an orange and be in relationship with each other. It is possible. I have coached couples where one person is monogamous, the other one is polyamory, and they actually work. And a lot of people judge them from the outside and tell stories that aren't true. But this person just doesn't want to relate with others. And this one does. And they're okay. And they've figured out a way to do that. Other people who are monogamous, other people who are poly, you know, and it does require, I think, moving at the pace of the other and accepting that we all are going to do it a little differently in polyamory or monogamy one person thinks of monogamy this way and one thinks of it like this and that you know let's talk about that and make sure we understand thank you scott mm -hmm. I think, oh jam um... jam do you have your hand up or were you just twinkling go ahead heidi yeah. I was just going to say, I think it's important, um, Lorna asked, I hope we talk about self-soothing, and I think self-soothing is very important, because wouldn't it be wonderful if the people outside of us always could soothe us, and darn they can't, <laughs> so self-soothing is super important. Um, I, I have some things that I use and that I share with clients, and I'm sure Timothy does too, and if any of you do, we're happy to hear that, so uh, it depends on what part of me is coming up. And this is kind of what I explore when I'm working with a client because how we soothe depends on who's showing up. So this kind of gets into what I think 
is called uh, sub personality work by some I call it who's doing the talking. So if it's our little, <laughs> if it's our inner child that's showing up that part of us that wasn't given attention from our dad or our mom, or maybe we had that sibling in a house that got all the attention because they were sick or they were an addict or whatever. If it's that part of us that's showing up, the soothing is going to be different for a six-year-old child than it would be for an adult, right? So discovering who's showing up inside of you is, I think, the first step in self-soothing. Who's doing the talking? And um, if it's my child, I'm going to soothe it with a hug, I might lay in fetal position on my bed and hug myself, just really physically wrapping myself up because a six-year-old might not understand a lot of words, but it understands physical touch and being held. A bath might feel good holding myself physically, but this is again, me being aware of myself. So this is what I take clients through, like what would feel good to your six-year-old? If it's your, um, you know, if it's my adult self showing up, she is not soothed by that. I do a lot of self-talk for her. So self-talk looks at, okay, and I, I'm pragmatic. I go through because my brain can spin out. So I like to break things down simply. What is being triggered? Okay, I'm not important. And if I'm not important, they'll leave me. So I'm going to be abandoned. So then I have to walk myself through the fear with self-talk. Am I okay on my own? Is there other people on the planet that can love me? Am I a good person? Am I being the best person I can be today? And I answer those questions. If I'm not being the best person I can be today, where can I show up differently? Not for them, but for me, right? So these are some of the things that I self-talk, physical soothing, um, Writing is also really helpful for me to self-soothe. If I'm feeling insanely or primally jealous or angry, I write a letter to that person. That stupid bitch, why is she texting him in the middle of the night? F her, blah, blah, blah. I'm never giving these letters. <laughs> this is me getting it out. This part of me that's not conscious or in my frontal lobe, I'm just spilling it out on the paper. So physical soothing, pen to paper, don't give it, don't text it, don't send it, it's just for you or share it with Timothy or I or a friend, a support group friend, right? Those are some of my ideas. What about you, Timothy, for self-soothing? My, my favorite thing is first to identify that we need it. So am I triggered is, and what is, what is being triggered? Heidi's kind of going there. And then can I, do I have the ability to self-resource and to soothe? Because sometimes I may need to go straight to asking for help because I'm so overwhelmed and so freaked out. I need to just call my dad or I need to call my coach or I need to call my best friend. First for me is usually going for a walk, telling the person that I got triggered by, I need to go for a walk. I'll be back and giving them a time frame, 15 minutes, taking that walk. Another one I love is Jay's, which I have this feather right here is soft touch. I'll just go and sit and just caress my skin with something really light. If I don't have a feather in my fingers from head to toe. And wow, usually that helps me come back to center and come back into my body. Another one I like is just <laughs> shaking from head to toe all the way down to the ground and all the way back taking deep breaths and vocalization is so amazing. Like in Heidi's case where that bitch is friggin' texting him at the middle of the night, sexy pictures, what's she doing? I'll go outside and away from my partner and literally just, ah, ah, I can't stand this. Ah. And then usually that'll bring me into, I'm so scared, I don't know what to do. And then back to some self-soothing, holding myself, reassurance, drinking water, taking a shower, a bath, doing some exercise, journaling like she was talking about. And my favorite for couples is if they can set the argument aside and do some light touch with each other. And we, you know, and then if you want to know more about light touch, there are resources at Love Coach Academy. It's a great resource. And there are two groups happening 
uh, every day where you can become part of a community. But also someone mentioned belly to belly. And for me, David Cates' work, and I use it with clients all the time, and I've changed it into my own, which is called aligning with each other. We set aside the jealousy, the issue, if we have the time. We come into alignment with each other by putting our bellies together, as I said earlier, looking into each other's eyes, breathing in uh, and sighing out and adding light touch at the same time. It's an amazing thing. All of a sudden, the argument's gone. Everything's gone. We both come back to presence and pleasure to be with one another. And then we can, in that same position, begin to try and talk about what's going on. And usually the way we approach the conversation now, because we're so close, is not in fight or flight mode, but is in a real tender, open mode where we're able to actually share, you know, what was coming up for me when this woman was texting you in the middle of the night was that you don't really respect me. You don't love me. You're about to leave me. You're going to go and, and do something else. And it's, it's really difficult for me. And hopefully our partner can hiss, listen to it. Whereas the first time we tried to talk, we said, you are just trying to fuck as many women as you can and you don't really care. You know, and we're triggered. We're not using appropriate language. So those would be some of my suggestions. Do we have other questions? Okay, Paul, more comment. Yeah, it's... Um... Empathy first. I know it's something Scott's taught forever and, and Marshall, but it's like before trying to come up with a solution, like going all the way back, Timothy, to your surfing or all the rest of it, the temptation is to come to solutions to quell the fear. But normally you end up with solutions that end up suppressing people rather than having that work out. So the whole thing is first, if you can give empathy and enter their world and hear their scary stories without trying to um, say, no, your story is all fucked up. It's all wrong. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have that story, but like, oh my God, no wonder you're terrified. You know, you thought that that meant I was going to leave you or something. And it's how to be with, how to have compassion for our scary stories. Here's a, good, once, ex a good example, just to illustrate really quick, and I'll come right back to you. My partner Tomoko's telling me, I don't like this lover that you have. She's ignoring me. She's not spending time with me. Rather than give empathy, as Paul's talking about, I went straight to, you know, this is your core wounding and <laughs> you, uh, you need to do some work on it. I'm not going to change. I didn't even listen. Right. And God. fortunately, I have good friends, good community, good coaches, good support. So pretty quickly, I realized, God, I'm being an idiot here. And came back to, I'm apologizing. I really value you. I would like you to repeat to me what you were saying before. Oh. And I'll be humble and honest. This did not happen in 24 hours. This took some work and a lot of good friends. And then she shared it again. And I was able to separate it out and recognize how she was feeling, acknowledge it, and then asked, what do you need from me? Right. right. She didn't really need that much. She mostly just needed me to be empathetic and to listen. And we eventually got to where I understood this isn't her core wounding or triggering. She's wanting to be respected. And she, her way of doing polyamory and open relating is that everybody that's relating with each other ought to be respecting each other and be kind with one another. When I figured that out, I went, oh, she's right. And I stopped the relationship or recalibrated the relationship with the other person because I don't want to be relating with someone who's not respecting people I love. Same, if someone doesn't respect Paul, I like Paul. I'm going to say, hey, wait, what are you doing, right? Even though Paul and I aren't lovers, I'm, I'm still going to intervene. Why wouldn't I do that with someone who I'm intimate with? So back to Paul, that's just an example of empathy first. Well, Timothy, thank <clears throat> you for your vulnerability and sharing that example, because I can... I can totally relate on both sides where I've gotten instantly defensive because part of me doesn't want the person I love to be hurting because of something I did. So rather than be with my discomfort around their discomfort, I try to tell them you shouldn't feel the way you feel, which is so reassuring to somebody. They just want to give me a hug anytime I do that. So thank you for this class. Um, and jealousy has been a lifelong sort of issue for me since 
you know, growing up like and bouncing between jealousy and envy. And so it's a really important conversation. And I don't know that we ever get cured of it, but we end up with some better tools and more compassion for it. Yes, Radiance. I'd like to speak into self-soothing for a moment. Um, I really enjoy just embracing it because so often I'm trying to push jealousy away or push hostility or anger or sadness or fear away. And so instead um, through like neuroscience, one of the things that I love doing is just dancing with it. I'll put on a great tune that really amplifies it and try to get as silly as I can with it. So that way I'm really embracing whatever part of me really wants to run from it and, uh, and uh, or distract myself from it. So instead I engage deeper with, um, with music it to, to just really like, wow, this can be really big and bold and beautiful. And it's a way that I get to meet myself in that space without asking others to make it better for me or do something about it. So that's where I try to start. Thank you. Thank you for that movement, dance being such a great tool for any emotional stuckness, right? Moving the body. You also triggered in me another self-soothing or self-care tactic, which is, oh, my husband's going surfing who can I go spend time with? What can I do that really makes me feel alive and brings me joy? It's really okay to have support when our partner is doing something that makes us jealous and, and or be distracted. And I'm not suggesting potato chips, hagen dazs and Netflix, but why not, right? Like if that's what it's going to take, then why not? Maybe not every time because you might balloon out and, and clog your arteries, but you know, if I say, hey, George, my partner's going out on a date and I know you like to play chess. Could I come over and play chess? Or I just say, George, could we have a chess date? He doesn't even need to know what's going on. And George and I play chess. It's distracting. It's healthy. And, and it helps me take care of myself during that difficult time. All right, Heidi or anybody else? And then we can close. Yeah, go ahead, Trevor. I just wanted to um, <clears throat> talk about something that came up for me that um, I don't know, might be difficult to share, but like when people become, when couples say become injurious towards each other um, in terms of like, you know, like, okay, we're talking about expanding the relationship or we're talking about, um, changing the relationship or the boundaries or the agreement. And then, um, you know, there can be sort of like a, a toxic thing that can come up in my experience where like, okay, well, fine. If you want to change, then I'll change like this. And it's not really collaborative, but sort of like chaotic chaos, you know, agent type stuff. <laughs> and I don't know why I'm saying it. I don't have like a anecdote or an answer but maybe someone else has an idea they can share. when it's, that happens sometimes a safe word yeah i think it comes back to what scott was saying earlier is that usually when that happens one person's moving faster than the other person is prepared to move and often the person who wants to move slower is is not lying to themselves but is deceiving themselves and their partner a little bit i see this a lot where they really want to be compersive and have their partner have everything they want, but they're not actually voicing, this is going too fast for me. And sometimes slowing down can be really encumbersome and difficult for the partner who is ready to expand and open up in whatever area it is. And, and so it, it does require an internal work of, wow, I really love this person. I do want to stay close with them. And I'm going to be willing to move at this slower pace. When we do, then often that combative energy that you're talking about or like one-upness, you know, oh, you're going to go out? Well, watch this. I'm going to date five people over here, right? I don't have any time for you. Um, or I'm going to go surfing all the time. Um, and so I do think it's about moving at a slower pace, but it's also about communicating vulnerably what's arising and not trying to take care of the other person but to really take care of ourselves um, and when people slow down like that and get vulnerable 
usually the whole compatibleness will settle. And I think we're in a, in a way we become into a relationship pause and both parties are willing to let go of their agendas and to just be with each other and be with what's actually happening underneath. And so, yes, a safe word like bananas or uh, stop, or could we come together or doing belly to belly. And, and I think it's hard on this end too, the one that wants to do something or expand or doesn't want to stop something. Um, in my case earlier, how I shared, I didn't want to stop relating with that other person. But when I finally recognized slowing down, coming to understand my partner, then it allowed me to go, oh, actually I do want to recalibrate that for me. I do want to stop that for me. I, I, I want my field of relating to be clear. I don't want it to be cloudy or worse, like uh, combative. Yeah, so sometimes more complexity brings, you know, more anxiety and stuff and how we, how we can deal with that is kind of directly related to how, how we can evolve or meet each other's needs or what have you, you know. It's, it's so important what this part, part of it because I see it over and over and over and over with couples and families. And so for the person who is moving faster, to what degree are you in compulsion versus conscious awareness? And remember that the slower we move, the more conscious we are. The faster we move, the more unconscious we are. And so quite often, especially if it's around something romantic or sexual, that the, the person moving faster might be in a compulsion or even in an addiction, right? Um, and so the person who wants to go slower can be seen as a drag and be seen in a judgmental way, but they actually, if we again, slow down and we, I love the word the trick to they used, recalibrate. Oh, wow, yeah. I was moving too fast for both of us, right? Thank you for slowing me down. Thank you for slowing us down. Thank you for slowing this train down, right? Just wanted to add that because it's, I've just seen it too many times how much painful it is when, when the fast person is leading and the, the slower person doesn't have the honor or the support to, to slow it down. Right. And, and you said about that feeling that we get when we do slow down, we come into our hearts, all the stuff we've heard before, but when we feel it, we know it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. We are at time, but Scott, are there any last minute announcements or things you want to? Um, yeah. You know what? I'd, I'd love to just, because this was the first class of our new series. So let's big twinkling. We twinkle in Love Coach Academy. Amazing job, Heidi and Timothy, getting us off to a great start. I'm so proud of all of our love coaches. And there's so many here on Prabha and Radiance and Deborah and Trish, um, Laura, uh, who did I forget? Jan, Jay, Paul. everybody. Paul. Oh, yeah. Oh, that guy. The guy in the other room. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. Um, so amazing coaches. So I just want to show everybody what's coming up. Because um, every Saturday now, for the next six months, we're going to have a Love Coach Academy class. And so if, um, for those of you that are not part of our core team, please register. You can find the place to register on my profile page. And this is kind of, you know, our talks all about the classes and the courses. Of course, this is one we just did. Next week, it's Radiance. The Radiance and her class is amazing. All about marriage to self. I've done her marriage to self ceremony. It's very cool. And then next week, we've got Trish, who's teaching about self-acceptance and repatterning the abandonment wound. The week after that, we've got the great Paul Sterling on compassionate communication for couples facing challenges, changes, and stress. And even if you're not in coupleship at the time, you're gonna learn tools that are really, really important for your next relationship, or maybe your relationship that's not romantic, but of a platonic nature. And so it goes, Jessica Osterday, Anuprabha will be doing harmonizing mind, body, and soul. She's an amazing sound healer. Um, Trish and I on the meaning of life, love and relationship. Laura, 
Laura is making her teaching debut with Love Coach Academy on world building identity, identifying and communicating values and needs. And so it continues, Heidi and Timothy are coming back. The power of love fantasy. None of us have ever done that. None of us have ever had like fantasies about love. No, it's amazing. And then we wrap up the series with an introduction to love coaching. So please, everybody, register. It's going to be a great 10 weeks. And it looks like the great Paul Sterling has something to say. I just want people also to be prepared because Scott's got his course coming up on um, relationship essentials. And it is, the, the title is really important. It is essential. There is a huge difference between talking and communicating. Be and, and it's like, go to the relationship gym. Most of the people that have been through relationship essentials come back two, three, four times because it's this, these are the basics that we all need to practice. And you'll hear Scott quoted through all of us and different times. And give your, you, you are worth it to come and give yourself the tools and set yourself up to win And that that starts in April. Um, yeah, that's, that starts right after this series. So this series ends April third, and that starts April tenth. And that's and great for singles, couples, families, fathers, everybody. sons, everybody. Yeah. I've gotten so much out of Relationship Essentials, and some of us are going to help Scott teach parts of it. We're really looking forward to it, and with Laura's help and Jessica's help and Trisha's help, we've done a, and Scott, we've done a lot of kind of reworking it was already amazing it's going to be even more amazing so yeah um several of the teachers you're seeing here are going to be co-facilitating that course with me um so it's really a love coach academy course taking really all of our best wisdom and i, I want to acknowledge on prava who i believe has taken that course the most times she and uh stephen um saver roland have both taken i think four times so um anyway uh, Paul got frozen. No, 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 you can't unplug because no, I'm not yeah, unplug. Yeah. Paul's coming over to complete his thought here. <laughs> Just come to the course. Say <laughs> That's it. All right. Just I'll... share it out with your friends. Share it out on your wall. Um, it's definitely a great value. And uh, thank you for being here with Heidi and I today. Heidi, any last thing? Yeah, I just want to acknowledge that your time is so precious and I honor that you spent it with us today. I just have one more thing. Um, there is a another course happening at the same time as Relationship Essentials. And that is also a, a 10 class series with um, some of our most popular coaches and beloved coaches. So that will be running at the same time as Relationships Essentials during the week. So it's on a Tuesday night. Um, we still haven't quite figured out the time yet, but that's kind of shuffling around to facilitate all of the worldly time zones. Um, and it'll also be a really fun add-on to Relationship Essentials. So look, keep on the lookout for that. Thank you, Trish, and thanks for putting that together. All right, let's try to come with you one more time. Thank and you, Heidi. I'll, I'll send out the recording to all of you, and we're also going to attach a couple of Love Coach Academy documents on self-sourcing and how to manage yourself when you get triggered. Um, so, and these are really good documents. So, those are written documents that come along with the video recording. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Scott. Bye-bye.